12 Anastasia again, the final chapter. Now remember in chapter 11, um, Anastasia and her mother were discussing what her friends or the people who are coming to visit Mrs. Stein are going to do. And um, Anastasia's mother doesn't realize that everyone's really old and they're talking about what's going to happen. Then the lady from the old people center, the drop-in, um, calls the house. Anastasia's mom's really confused because she's told they're diabetic, but it's very unusual for young people to be diabetic. So she's confused. She doesn't realize they're all old. She's worried it's a gang for some reason. And Steve, um, the boy that met Anastasia and invited her over, um, is also inviting her to meet her f to meet his family. And Anastasia's really excited because she knows they're a great family that are very successful and she can't go. And at the end of the chapter, she has an argument with her mother and she begins writing more about her life in a story. Chapter 12. Anastasia woke up early on Saturday morning and before she opened her eyes, she heard a sound that sounded like Frank Goldfish. Frank, she said sleepily, what are you doing? Cut it out. It's too early to be playing. Go back to sleep. But the sound continued and Anastasia woke up a little more, opened her eyes a tiny bit and realized it was raining. High up here in her tower room, wet tree leaves were blowing against her windows. Anastasia grinned. Terrific. Robert and Jenny wouldn't be able to ride their bikes out here in the rain. Probably her dad would be willing to drive Gertrude uh, Gertrustein down to the beauty parlor to get a haircut. Maybe the Harveys wouldn't go to Sturbridge and maybe Anastasia could walk over and meet Anne, at least before she went back to New York, that's Steve's sister. And in the afternoon, all the senior citizens, the old people could come. Fran McCormick would bring them in the van that was painted with a gross name, Oldster Roadster. She turned over, hugged her pillow and went back to sleep. But when she woke again later, the rain had stopped. Downstairs, her mother was brushing Sam's hair. Sam's going with Mrs. Stein to the beauty parlor, she said, so I thought he'd better look glamorous. Don't let them cut your hair, Sam, said Anastasia, buttering a piece of toast. Do my curls look pretty? asked Sam anxiously. Good grief. There was so much that Sam didn't know yet. Not pretty, Sam, Anastasia told him. Handsome. Boys aren't supposed to look pretty, only handsome. Oh, you're not taking your flashlight, are you? No, it's in its hiding place. Tonight we play flasher. Anastasia's mother looked out the window. It looks as if it might rain again. The sky's pretty gray. She went to the closet, got Sam's little raincoat and buttoned him into it. There you are, old buddy. Your stroller's over at Mrs. Stein's. Have a nice time and behave yourself. They watched through the window as Sam walked and trotted across the yard and climbed the steps to Mrs. Gertrude Stein's porch. Now, what's next? Kool-Aid. Anastasia's mother got the Kool-Aid out of the cupboard. Might as well make it now, so Robert and Jenny can have some when they get here. Be sure to, leave, to tell them to leave plenty for the Mafia. Mum! Her mother chuckled. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sure your new friends are actually very nice, Anastasia. I was just in a rotten and a bad mood yesterday. I've been working on a painting for a week now, and it just isn't going very well. You know how grouchy your father gets when he's writing a poem that doesn't seem to work and he blames us, even though we've never even seen the poem? Anastasia laughed. Yeah, well, I've been writing a novel for about three months now myself. It took me two and a half months just to think of a title. And now the novel doesn't seem to have much connection to the title. Oh goodness, that would be a problem. Also, I'm having a hard time getting all the ingredients in. Ingredients? Hmm, it's a mystery novel. I finally put in lots of mysterious characters. Then I remembered I needed a dead person. So I got that in at the end of chapter four, but there's no sex yet. Sex, are you sure you need sex in a mystery novel? Anastasia thought. Nancy Drew books didn't have that. Nancy's boyfriend was a little retarded that way, Anastasia thought. He was old enough to drive for Pete's sakes, but he went on for book after book after book without ever developing any interest. But that was one reason that Nancy Drew books were boring. Agatha Christie books had hints of love affairs, but nothing explicit. 
Anastasia wanted her mystery novel to be even more interesting than Agatha Christie's. Yeah, she said. Maybe I need some in chapter five. Stir. Stir my novel? No, dummy. Stir the Kool-Aid. Mix the Kool-Aid. They filled several old cider, cider jugs. There, said her mother. We can add ice cubes when we serve it. Probably my gangland friends will sneak some vodka in too. Anastasia, you're not serious, are you? Anastasia groaned. No, ma'am, I was only kidding. Watching from the front window, Anastasia saw that as they came around the corner, she grinned. Actually, it would be fun to see Jenny again. She had missed Jenny. Probably, if the situation had been reversed, she would have gone to see Casablanca herself, she had to admit. But she groaned when she saw Robert, good old Jerko Giannani, right here, right here at her very corner for Pete's sake. He had stopped his bike and was consulting and looking at a map. Anastasia could see that Jenny was pointing to the house and yelling at him. But Robert was busy looking and consulting his map, which he then folded very carefully and put in his back pocket. Typical of Robert to, to be able to fold a map. He was the only person Anastasia had ever met who could fold a map. And he had his briefcase, of course. She could make out its rectangular outline, even though it was wrapped in something. Of course, dark green plastic. Typical that Robert had wrapped his briefcase in a trash bag so that it wouldn't get wet. Gross. And his feet. What was wrong with his feet? Anastasia squinted and closed her eyes so that she could see more clearly. Oh no, she couldn't believe it. Sick. Sick! Robert Giannani was wearing rubbers. Hi, Jenny, Anastasia said and made a special face at her, which meant, look at Robert wearing rubbers. Hi, said Jenny and made a face back, which meant, I know it's the grossest thing I have ever seen. Well, said Robert Giannani, we made it, Anastasia. I can see that, Robert. Come on in. <clears throat> Robert and Jenny loved Anastasia's new house. It made her feel good, showing it to them and seeing it in a new way herself, as she did. She felt a little like a real estate dealer, someone selling houses, opening doors and saying, this is the study and this is the studio where my mother paints. Although she closed the door again quickly when she realized that her mother had been working on a nude, which is drawing someone naked. Especially she liked taking them up to her tower room. Even with the wallpaper partly peeled off, the room was exciting, set up high in the tops of the trees, with a view that stretched so far that they could see the tall Hannock building in Boston in the distance. Robert said, You know, Anastasia, when you pull off these layers of wallpaper, you peel away a whole history of your room. Who lived in the house last? Anastasia shrugged. Some doctor and his wife. They had five kids. Well, probably one of the kids lived up here, don't you think? So this top layer of paper belongs to that kid. He pulled off a section of that paper near the window. Now look, he said, green with flowers. Under that, wonder who lived here then? Maybe a young couple, said Jenny. Maybe the husband beat the wife so that she used to come up here to hide from him. That's really old fashioned paper, said Anastasia, looking at the pattern more closely. Probably it was way back in the 1930s or something, when everything was different. Maybe the wife wanted to go out and get her job instead of staying home and cooking. That's why he beat her. The rat, muttered Jenny. What's underneath? Robert picked with his fingernail at the green flowered paper until a piece of it came loose, came off. Blue with a sort of stripped pattern. This one's really old. He pulled more of the green away. Wonder who lived here then? A family that had a crazy uncle. They kept him chained up here in the tower, suggested Jenny. Yeah, said Robert. He used to keep track of the days and weeks by making, by mar by making marks on the wall. Look, right here is a mark he made. Robert was right. At the edge, still partly covered by the green paper, was a mark made with pink, with pen and ink. It probably says, help, I'm being held hostage and captive in this tower. Be careful, Robert, don't tear it. Anastasia laughed as she, after she said that, telling someone who wears rubbers, carries a briefcase and folds a map caref uh, correctly to be careful. Really dumb.
That's someone who is always careful. He finally lifted up a strip of green paper and exposed all of the faded writing. They leaned over and tried to figure out what it said. It was certainly not the marks of a madman counting the days of a captivity. Anastasia made it out and opened her mouth in astonishment. I know what this is. Good grief. Wait till... But she was interrupted. Her mother called from the bottom of the tower stairs. Anastasia, you get down here right away. Two vans just pulled into the driveway. Your guests are here. An hour later, some of the confusion had subsidized, had subsided, had gone. Everyone was on their second cup of Kool-Aid and Anastasia's mother had opened the box of imported cookies that she had been saving since last Christmas for a special occasion. Although Edna, Morris and Ernest, being diabetic, couldn't eat them. Anastasia's father was in the study, showing off his first additions to, the Har to Harry, who had once taught European literature at Tufts University, and to Jeanette, who years ago had managed a Boston bookstore. Robert had opened his briefcase and was showing some rocket plans to Morris and Fred, who were retired engineers, and they were arguing over the rocket Robert had designed could possibly make it to the moon. Edna and four other ladies were showing Jenny photographs of their grandchildren. Someone was playing Alexander's ragtime band on the piano, and a tiny lady with snow white hair was dancing around and around the dining room all by herself. In the studio, the man with no hair at all was looking wise wistfully at the half-finished painting of a nude. Someone kept asking if the Krupniks had a croquet set or a badminton, a badminton set or a volleyball. In the kitchen, Fran McCormick was helping Anastasia's mother make some more Kool-Aid, and they were both laughing so hard that they were almost crying. And I thought she meant a motorcycle gang, Anastasia's mother sputtered. Anastasia wandered into the kitchen. Anastasia, laughed Fran. I think your mother is going to clobber and punch you after we leave. Anastasia perched on the kitchen stool, chewed on a cookie and grinned. This is a good party, she said. Even Robert Giannani is a hit. I think Robert is really an 80-year-old man in a 12-year-old body. Is everybody okay in there? The new batch of Kool-Aid's almost ready, said her mother, stirring. Everyone's fine. Someone wants to play croquet. Some other people are having a contest over who, is the, who has the best-looking grandchildren. So there are photographs all over the place. The guy with the bald head wishes you had painted the nude bigger. Tell him to go buy a Playboy. I did. And Mom, I just saw Gertrude and Sam go into her house. The point of this party was to introduce Gertrude to everyone. How shall we get her to come over? Her mother went to the telephone and dialed. Mrs. Stein, this is Catherine Kropenick. How did it go at the beauty parlor? Don't tell her there are people here, hissed Anastasia, or she won't come. Her mother gestured to her to be quiet. Oh, Gertrude, I'm sure it looks lovely. You just aren't used to it. Anastasia remembered something. Tell her, she whispered, that I have something I absolutely have to show her. Her mother gestured. Shut up. Of course you're not going to wear a hat for the rest of your life, her mother was saying into the phone. He what? That little beast. She put her hand over the receiver and whispered to Fran and Anastasia. Sam told her she looks like Art Garfunkel. Sam loves Art Garfunkel, said Anastasia. Gertrude, Anastasia tells me that Sam loves Art Kafunkel, her mother said into the telephone. So he means it as a compliment. Listen, Gertrude, why don't you bring Sam over here now? I want to see your perm, and Anastasia has something that she says she absolutely has to show you. After she hung up, she said apprehensively to Fran and Anastasia, this may be a terrible mistake. She says she intends to put a large hat and go to bed in a dark room for the rest of her life. Mom, Anastasia pointed out, she's saying that for the same reason she says she doesn't like people. She's scared. Is she coming over? Yes, in fact, there she is now, coming out of her house with Sam. You go and greet her at the door, Anastasia. They watched through the window as Gertrude Stein and Sam came across the yard, and Anastasia ran to open the door. Gertrude Stein was, as she said, wearing a large green hat which covered her hair. Good afternoon, Anastasia, she said. I've brought your brother back, and your mother says that you have something to show me. The piano, the piano began again with, 
You are my sunshine. People began to sing. There was a thump in the dining room and Anastasia cringed. The white-haired lady had just bumped into the table as she danced. Sam looked startled and scared at the noise. He dropped Gertrude Stein's hand and said, I'm going to hide, and scooted and ran upstairs. I wasn't aware that you had guests, Gertrude Stein sniffed. I'll come back another time. No, no, it's okay, said Anastasia casually. It's just some friends who stopped by. Come on in. She took Gertrude Stein by the hand and practically dragged her into the living room. Everybody, announced Anastasia in a loud voice, I would like you to meet my friend Gertrude Stein. The senior citizens clustered and gathered around Gertrude Stein, introducing themselves. Someone put a paper cup of Kool-Aid into her hand. The woman with orange hair sat back down at the piano and began to play As Time Goes By, the song from Casablanca. A kiss is just a kiss, Edna and Fred began to sing. Here's looking at you, kid said the bald-headed man in a not-too-bad Humphrey Bogart voice to Gertrude Stein and held up his cup of Kool-Aid in a toast. Anastasia saw that Gertrude Stein's mouth was beginning to twitch at the edges into a smile. The doorbell rang. At the door was Steve Harvey with the tallest, most beautiful girl Anastasia had ever seen. Oh, I didn't realise you were having so much company, Steve said loudly to make himself heard over the noise. This is Anne. We didn't go to Sturbridge because of the rain this morning, and Anne wanted to meet you before she goes back to New York. That's Steve's sister. Anastasia grinned, shook Anne's hand, and brought them inside. She thought for a minute that she would try to explain about the company. Then she looked in the living room, saw seven senior citizens, plus Gertrude Stein, still wearing her big, big green hat, arranging themselves into a circle to do some sort of dance and decided that it would be impossible to explain. My parents are outside in the car, explained Steve. Do you think? Sure, said Anastasia, bring them in. Finally, the noise had lessened. Everyone was worn out and the Kool-Aid was almost gone. Anne Harvey had d demonstrated a dance from a Broadway musical. And when she had asked politely if she could wear Gertrude Stein's green hat for the dance, Gertrude Stein had finally taken the hat off. Everyone had admired her new mass of silver curls, curly hair. There had been a long discussion about Art Garfunkel, and they had played an Art Garfunkel record on the stereo. Mr. Harvey had done an imitation of Howard Coswell. Anastasia's father had read a poem about baseball. Then Mr. Harvey had read the same poem in his Howard Coswell voice. The man with the bald head with no hair, was now wearing the big green hat. Everyone was exhausted from laughing and singing. For the first time in two hours, the house was quiet as they all gathered their breath in order to say goodbye. There was the soft padding sound of bare feet coming down the stairs. It's my brother, said Anastasia softly. I wonder what had happened to him. Sam appeared in the doorway and everyone said, Oh, the way people do when they see a curly headed baby but Anastasia's heart sank. No, Sam, she said silently. Don't do it, Sam, she cringed. The instant she saw that Sam was wearing his raincoat and that below his legs and feet were bare, she knew what was coming. I'll kill you, Sam, she thought. Sam grinned and stood in the doorway, looking at the room full of senior citizens and Gertrude Stein and his parents and the Harveys and Jenny and Robert. Flash! he said loudly and opened his raincoat, showing everyone himself naked. <laughs> then he scampered away, naked. Everyone sat politely for a moment. Then the senior citizens began to giggle. And Harvey started to laugh. Gertrude Stein laughed so hard that her art Garfunkel curls were moving and shook. Mr. Harvey announced, Ladies and gentlemen, an astonishing thing has happened, in his Howard Cossel voice. It was time for everyone to go home. Gertrude Stein, I really do like your hair, said Anastasia, and I'm glad you had fun at the party. Hmm, said Gertrude Stein. Sam had been tucked away for his nap, and they were cleaning up the kitchen. Mom, do you know what Robert Giannani said when he and Jenny were leaving? What? Anastasia giggled. He came over to me privately and said in this very serious voice, Anastasia, I thought that your brother had a birth defect. 
I didn't realize that you meant he was emotionally disturbed. I'm really sorry. That jerk, said Anastasia's mother. Of course, Sam was really obnoxious. I will admit that. It was probably my fault, pointed out Gertrude Stone, since it was I who suggested to him that we play Flasher. Gertrustine, said Anastasia, I just remembered. I really do have something to show you. Do you think you could climb up all the stairs to my room? Gertrustine groaned. Ugh, can't you bring it down? No, come on, we could go slow. The two of them climbed the staircase to the second floor. Then puffing, Gertrustine made it to the tower. Actually, she said, I think the dancing helped my arthritis. I think maybe I'll enroll in their folk dancing class. Look, said Anastasia, kneel down here, Gertrustine, so you can see. They knelt side by side and Anastasia pointed to the faded writing on the oldest layer of wallpaper. Edward loves Gertrude, always, Gertrustine read aloud. My goodness, I wonder when he wrote that. There's no date. Well, it really doesn't matter what he wrote, when he wrote it, I guess. It's nice to know that he did. Gertrustine blushed a little. I wonder where he is now. Probably being a senior citizen somewhere. Maybe you could find him. But Gertrustine hooted. I wouldn't even want to now. He's probably fat. Better just to remember him. Of course, it would be nice if... If what? Gertrustine played and patted her curls. If he could see my new hairdo, she laughed. Chapter 5, wrote Anastasia at the top of a new page. She had begun to be a little bored with novel writing. So she decided that chapter five would be the final chapter. That meant she knew from Agatha Christie that she had to bring all the characters together, preferably in a locked room, and solve the mystery. And she realized that it was not entirely clear just what the mystery was. But it was in the title, The Mystery of Saying Goodbye. Okay, she just had to connect the title with the plot, with the main idea. Anastasia spit out some eraser bits that she had nibbled off accidentally and began to write. All of the characters, she wrote, were in the same room. Suddenly, creeping silently down from the tower, came a naked man. Then she frowned, crossed out man and wrote little boy. But that was no good. There was nothing sexy about a little boy, naked or not. Well, she thought, it is a novel. It doesn't exactly have to be true. So she wrote again. Suddenly, creeping silently down from the tower, came a naked man. All he was wearing was a coat, and he carried a flashlight. He threw open the door to the room, opened his trench coat, laughed an evil laugh, and disappeared. There, so much for the sex. Now to connect the title. The tall bearded man said to everyone, Goodbye, I am going to take a nap now. The blue-eyed tennis player said to a young girl, Goodbye. Do you want to play tennis later if it doesn't rain? The young girl said, Goodbye, yes I do. The tall ballerina said, Goodbye, I think I will go to New York now, to be in the ballet. The cruel and subservient housewife, who actually turned out to be pretty nice, said, Goodbye, I'm going to wash the Kool-Aid pitches. The woman who looked like a witch, except she didn't anymore, said, Goodbye, I will help you wash the Kool-Aid pitches. Where is my green hat? The bold man who was wearing her green hat took it off and gave it to her. Goodbye, he said. Maybe we could have dinner together some night soon. A whole batch of old people said goodbye, and they went home, and some of them had to babysit for their grandchildren. The strange young man wearing a Seawell t-shirt said, Goodbye, everyone. I am sorry about the naked, emotionally disturbed man. Where is my briefcase? The Irish woman with the chip tooth said, here it is. Don't forget your dumb rubbers. Goodbye, all. The famous sportscaster said, This is Howard Cossel, wishing you goodbye after what has proven to be an eventful afternoon. The lady lawyer who had once prosecuted an axe murderer said, Will you stop that ridiculous Howard Cossel imitation? Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much for including us. The young girl realized, after they had all left, that there were many different ways to say goodbye. That solved the mystery. Anastasia read chapter five again. It was the longest chapter of her novel, but she realized it was still lacking something. She realized she was missing uh, a mention of the corpse of a dead body. 
But those things were easy to add. She wrote two more sentences. The naked man had a poking out belly button and Mozart was still dead. Then she wrote the end and went to get a tennis racket. For reasons that scientists have not yet figured out, goldfish seem to be more adaptable than young girls. So that's the end of the book and the end of the chapter. So in the end, um, they have the party with the senior citizens and everyone's happy together. And she finishes her book on chapter five and it ends very nicely. Now, I know there's a couple of it says the word sex a few times. But the main point of the novel is that she's kind of writing about her own life and her experiences through different characters, which is what we've also done in English. So I really hope you enjoyed the book. I think it's a really nice, quite funny and important book that has a couple different lessons. Goodbye.